Hello, you're listening to Startup. I'm Alex Bloomberg, guest hosting, as I sometimes do, for the regular host, Lisa Chow. Lisa will be back in the hosting seat next week. But I'm here this week for a reason. So some of you might remember an episode we did last season. It was an episode where we asked listeners to send in questions to the show, questions for me to answer. We had people asking us all sorts of things, questions about how it felt to grow so fast, questions about like all the TV projects that we had going on. There was a whole range of stuff. But there was one caller that we didn't include in that episode. His question was just too big to fit in with the other ones. Hello? Hi, this is Alex Bloomberg calling from the Startup Podcast. (laughs) Wow. Okay, first of all, it's amazing that I'm talking to you right now. Um, (laughs) I'm kind of freaking out about it. Uh, my name is Skylar Gronholt. Um, did you want me to tell you a little bit about why, why yeah, yeah. Where, I wanted where, to talk to you? Where am I talking to you from? Okay, so I'm actually literally in the middle of a drive from Seattle to Bellingham. I'm, I'm moving up there to like try to officially start over <laughs> my life. I got released from prison a year ago. Um, since I've been out, uh, well, so like a year ago, I started listening to a startup and loved the show. And like probably by like episode four or five, I was driving to this really crappy job where I was like cleaning out rat poop and pee from like uh, crawl spaces underneath houses. Oh um, yeah, it was really, really bad. So I started listening to a show and like on my way to work, I was like, what if I started a show where... Um, I'm doing what you you were doing for startup, but like for someone starting up their life coming out of prison. I talked to Skylar that afternoon for almost an hour. And over the course of my career, I've talked to people who have been in prison. I've talked to people who've just gotten out of prison. I've heard plenty of stories on the radio about people getting out of prison and trying to start their lives over. But I'd never heard anyone talk about it like Skylar did. And in talking to him, there were a lot of surprising parallels between what he was going through and what anybody who's ever tried to start something new for the first time goes through. There's the self-doubt, the fear of failure, the yearning for people to care about this thing that you're doing. And so today, we're devoting the entire episode to Skylar's story, to his attempt to restart his life, to what he did to upend that life in the first place, and to the strange, radical and surprisingly familiar to listeners of this podcast strategy he came up with to get everything back on track again. And a warning, there's some swearing in this episode. Skylar told me that his path to prison started not long after high school. He'd had to drop out of college because he lost his scholarship. His grades weren't where they needed to be. He was newly married and working a job that he hated. I'm working construction for, uh, you know, this just asshole dude. And like, um, I get my wisdom teeth pulled and so I start taking Vicodin. Vicodin progresses into a full blown addiction. Uh, six months into my, my marriage, I'm going to rehab at that rehab. My, my roommate is a heroin dealer. So like I walk out of that rehab, not with just a Vicodin habit, but like with a heroin habit, like Mm. that's, Within, I think, the first week of graduating rehab, like, I was getting introduced to that whole world. And, like, so then there, there was, like, six years of, you know, of pretending like I had it all together. Like, pretending that I wasn't an addict so that my wife wouldn't freak out and, like, all my friends and stuff. None of them were drug addicts. My wife was getting her master's in psychology. And I'm, like, going into heroin dealers' houses that are just disgusting, like, every single day, and being this other person, being, like, this total, total fraud, and, yeah, it just kept getting worse and worse, and, and so it eventually led me to stealing a projector and a few computers from the local college that we lived next to, Mm -hmm. so that I could not use the little bit of money that we had left in our account, um, so I could get high, and got caught. And oh man, and then it all came out, and your wife found out. And oh, yeah, yeah, she left. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what it's my own doing, like, like I, uh, yeah, I mean, it no, I mean, that must have been, yeah, 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 it was really bad. It sucked in prison. Skylar kept himself busy with work shifts and classes, did the crossword every day, got himself clean. 
And due to his good behavior, he ended up serving just three years out of his five-year sentence. After his release, he moved back in with his parents, got that rat poop cleaning job that he hated. And he was struggling to stay positive. He was feeling more and more like if things didn't change, he'd slide back into addiction, end up back in prison. And that is when he had a thought I would not have predicted from somebody facing what he was facing. He thought, I'll start a podcast about my own life. This is what's going to save me. And like the second I thought about it, it was like I could breathe again. It just gave everything like this new kind of context and, and definitely gave me a sense of purpose, which is what I just desperately needed. And, and so I was kicking around the idea and like didn't know exactly how to do it. And I was actually talking to my probation officer, who's like a, a screenwriter by, by screenwriter by trade. And like he was, he was like, like a ridiculously amazing probation officer. Wait, um, your probation officer is a screenwriter by trade? Yeah, like that, that's, <laughs> what does his, that mean? that's his first love. <laughs> like he's written for movies and stuff like that's that. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it was really trippy when I first met him. So, so your probation officer, who was a screenwriter, you were telling him about this that you wanted to start a podcast. Yeah, yeah. and 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 so he tells me this story of like, oh yeah, I like my first screenplay. Like I was sitting on it for years until one day I just like grabbed some. Uh, grab some buddies and like hit record or whatever and just started making a movie and all of a sudden like I was making my first movie so he's like so when you leave here today just pull out your phone and pull up like a voice memo thing and just hit record and you will be making a podcast so I was like okay I'm gonna do it and like man that he is a good probation officer oh he was the best we would have like two or three hour long conversations when I'm supposed to just be going in there to like pee in a cup for him <laughs> uh-huh. wow so, like, I get in my car and I hit record. Well, I'm just leaving my probation office. This is actually my first recording of this podcast. This is that very first recording that Skylar made. He's recording it into his phone as he gets in his car and starts driving. I'm not starting a small business. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm starting... A life. I'm I'm 31 years old. Um, I am two and a half months out of a 60 month prison sentence for uh, nine felonies. Oh no, ten felonies. Uh, um. He talks for about 40 minutes. When he finally gets to where he's going, he turns off the engine and keeps recording. He's rambling a little, sounding sad. And then he starts talking directly to the people he imagines listening. I'm learning how to live, and I want you guys to to learn with me. Um, I I need your support. I need to know that you're there um, listening to this. I need to know that you care about whether or not I choose to go right or choose to go left. I need to know that my life has purpose and value because right now it seems like my parents are the only ones to whom my life really matters. And that's lonely. After this first recording, Skylar kept at it. He recorded conversations with his brother Shane, a meeting where he applied to get food stamps talks with his mom and dad, and all sorts of just mundane stuff. Gosh, I've got to get this key fixed. That was horrible. Like this recording, where Skylar gets back to his parents' house late one night. He walks in, plays with the dog for a minute. Then you hear the voice of his mom, Debbie. It sounds like Skylar's just woken up. So funny tonight. You guys are on the air. We're on the air? Yeah. Oh! The whole world is hearing you. <laughs> in the future. Oh, good. I've acquired, like, just uh, hours and hours of tape about, like, my life. This is Skylar and me, back on that first phone call in the studio again. You know, um, seeing people again that I hadn't seen since before prison and, like, court dates that I had to go to and, um... I kind of feel like if I wasn't recording, I might not have done them. 
that it just it didn't have any weight to me. Like I was kind of already expecting me to myself to fail, given that like it's like 75 to 80 percent of everyone in prison will return to prison. I set out to like I was going to defy those odds, and and then all of a sudden, you know, after the tenth hoop that I'm having to jump through that just seems so stupid, I was already questioning like if I had the fortitude to like actually get through this thing and um and so then once I started recording like it gave me a sense of purpose to to do that stuff I get that because because I think yeah I've I've had that experience too where where like sometimes like I know there's a conversation that I'll have to have or there's a thing I'll have to do or there's a thing I'm afraid to do or there's a thing that feels like a pain in the ass to do and if you're not recording it, then it's just going to be something that happens that, like, yes. doesn't matter. Yes. But if you're recording it, then you're like, well, maybe it'll matter somehow. Yes. If I share it with somebody else. That's exactly how it felt. Okay. So, so, so what's your question? Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> okay. So if I can just be, like, brutally honest with you. Uh, Absolutely. I, like, okay, so I... Like, I, I feel like if there was anyone that I could talk to about this idea, like what I want to do, like you would be n- number one. Uh-huh. Um, but like, I'm not even really sure what exactly the question is that I need to ask you. Um, I, I wasn't planning on saying that, but um, I don't want to ask you this question that I was like, why did I ask him that? Like, uh-huh. right. But yeah, like, so I've been, I've been so obsessing on like, story formula and creating a great product. And, uh, you know, my standards are super, super high. And even though Ira Glass talks about this gap thing and like, I should be okay with that. I'm not okay with like putting out an episode that sounds like crap. You What's know? the gap thing? Tell me about you that. haven't heard that? No. Oh, well maybe, maybe. Uh, so that guy's a hack, man. I'm just joking. <laughs> <Shut up. laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, he taught me everything I know. I was just joking. Yeah, go ahead. Um, no, he. So he talks about um, when you first start. When you're first starting creating anything, like your taste is, like let's say it's it's set very high, but when you're just starting out, like there's this huge gap between your uh, ability currently and and you need to be okay with that and you need to just start creating uh, regardless of the fact that like it's, n- it's not any anywhere close to what you want to be cr- putting out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would add that like that, please add. that's like essential. Like the only way yeah. that, you, that you can get better Man. is by, is by sucking and then learning exactly how you suck and then sort of trying to like, okay, well what if I do it different this time? You know? Uh, there's no other way. So how do you how do you prevent the total despair that I've been feeling like um, I'm just being a complete fraud? It's almost like I'm fighting against this tension of like I can't afford to waste time. Like if I screw up, if I make the wrong step here, like I'm going back to prison. Like like my right. freedom and life is at stake here. Like um, is that uh, what it feels like? It feels yeah, like totally, if you don't, if totally. the stakes are that high. Like it's not just my podcast will suck, but my podcast will suck. Get get me from like my podcast sucks to I'm back in prison. Okay, okay. So so anytime I feel sad, anytime I feel uh, even anytime I feel glad, like any kind of emotion, like in 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 recovery and stuff, like they talk of like that, it, it can all be a trigger. A trigger for very, what? A trigger for what? Oh, a, a trigger to go and, and get to, to, to do drugs again. Uh. And so if I, if I let the sense of being a fraud start growing roots, or if I let shame start growing roots in any kind of way, that will possibly lead me to relapse. And if I relapse, all bets are off. I'm going to make some drastic mistake and go to prison like that. Like the, the line is, is no longer like a gigantic, you know, great wall of China. Like it's a, it's a little crack in the, in the concrete. Mm -hmm. That's, that's how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. So this thing that felt like it was saving you to get good at it, it also feels like you're, it puts you in risk. 
my gosh, that that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So much so that like now I I I just over the last few weeks, so I built like this whole uh, home studio thing and like just kept being like, okay, if I if I can just listen to enough of Alex Bloomberg talking about how he does it, like I will be able to make a good product. Um, like, so uh, now <laughs> oh, all that, like, I wish yeah, it, I, I wish I, it worked that way. I don't think you like can, that. I don't think so. I mean, I think, I don't think you can get good at anything like that without, without exposing yourself to fear and, and feeling bad. Uh, I've never yeah, seen it happen. Yeah. I've never seen it happen. But but I also feel like I don't think you can live a life without exposing yourself to fear and feeling bad. So right. So I mean, right. I don't think it's putting you at any more risk than you're already in. You know? Yeah. I've never been to prison. I've never used heroin. My circumstances couldn't get more different than Skylar's in many ways. But it was shocking during this conversation how familiar what Skylar was going through felt to me. We both started podcasts out of a feeling of not knowing what else to do. This vague sense that if we documented what we were doing, then maybe what we were doing actually mattered. That if we imagined success, imagined a big audience out there listening to what we were making, that one day success would actually come. And in fact, starting a podcast did bring me success. It helped me start a company. Could starting a podcast possibly help Skylar with his project too? Restarting his own life? After the break, we find out. We send startup producer Molly Messick to Bellingham, Washington to catch up with Skylar and to find out, can making a podcast about the story of your life actually change the way you live it? That's coming up after these words from our sponsor. This episode of Startup is brought to you by Squarespace, which offers beautiful templates, 24-7 customer support, and optimization for mobile right out of the box. Because even if you've got a zillion-dollar idea without a website, it's just an idea. My name is Jorge, and I am the associate producer for Gimlet Creative. Tell me your zillion-dollar idea. I hate ironing. Mm -hmm. Like, so much. So what I propose is a steam closet, like in your normal closet. And then you would like hit a button that would turn your your closet into a sauna. The next time you grab something out of your closet, it'll be wrinkle free. And full of mold. Maybe. (laughs) I mean, I haven't figured out all the science yet. There could be a window. There could be like a vent, you know, similar to like your bathroom. And also it could double as like a personal sauna. You can just hang out in your closet and just, you know, (laughs) de-stress a little bit. If you've got a zillion dollar idea, you're going to need a website to make it a reality. A website from Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code STARTUP to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Welcome back to Startup. Molly Messick picks up Skylar's story from here. A couple of months after Skylar and Alex talked, I flew out to Bellingham, Washington to meet Skylar. I found him outside his apartment building, but before we went in, we walked to a grocery store nearby so he could pick up dinner. So is this this sort of your normal routine? Is this a thing you do? Yeah, either walk or ride my bike. When we get to the store, Skylar heads to a juice section along one wall and picks out a protein drink and a smoothie. Then he walks to the back wall of the store, steering clear of the center aisles, and gets some yogurt. Smoothies and yogurt are what he eats most of the time, he says. He's had a fair amount of anxiety since prison, and he thinks it's affecting his stomach. But that's not the only reason he eats this way. I'm really bad at decisions now, uh, which is, I mean, maybe I've always been a little indecisive, but I think that's why I kind of do this, is uh, that. He gestures to the whole middle of the store, the produce and snacks and frozen foods. Freaks me out. (laughs) Like the whole grocery store. Oh, yeah. Like, it gets me totally panicky and almost. Do do you connect that with, like, all the decisions that get made for you in prison? I I mean, it has to be. It has to be. The the thing that I don't like that I I think that I judge myself almost for is, like, I wasn't in there that long. Like, I... 
I haven't sat down with anyone yet, I don't think, that did, you know, 15, 20 years. I can't, I, I can't imagine. I, I don't feel like I earned the right to, like, have these kind of anxieties. I don't know if that makes any sense. Do you want a bag? Yeah, please. When we get to the checkout, a couple of Skylar's cards get declined before one finally works. It seems like he knows this checkout person, and like they've been through this before. I think, yeah, I think we did this last time. Yeah, insufficient. Okay. Do you want to try again? Yeah, let's go like this. Cool. It was just a quick trip to a grocery store, but it summed up a lot about where Skylar is right now. He's pretty anxious, and he doesn't have much money, and he's constantly thinking about how prison changed him. It's not what he expected when he was still in prison and looking forward to getting out. You know those little cars that you twist up, like the ones that you pull back and like the wheels are whining and then you let go and then you just boom. That tension was building exponentially almost, like the closer I got to actually getting out. You know, my parents came and saw me like every week and the closer the they came, like the more tension was being built of like, I finally get to be me. And then I get out and the car's released and like it just boom, right into a wall and like crashes and turns upside down and, you know, gets set on fire. That's how it felt. Like all that, that, that excitement and ambition just totally crashed. Starting over was a lot more challenging than he thought it would be. At 31, he was back home with his parents, having a hard time finding work. His old friends from before prison weren't around very much, and a couple of the friends he made during prison weren't doing well. They were back to using drugs or back in jail. Skylar was lonely and struggling with his urge to use again. It seemed like it was all going very badly, which scared him because that meant he was on a path toward failure. And in his mind, failure meant relapse and maybe prison. Skylar had started listening to podcasts pretty early, in 2006. He was a big fan of Radio Lab and This American Life. And after getting out, he started listening again. With a kind of crazy intensity, by the way. At one point, he subscribed to 126 shows. And one of the things he listened to was Startup. When he heard it, he had a flash of inspiration. It was something like, start recording my life as if I have 50,000 listeners every week. And start living my life as if I had 50,000 people that cared. We've listened to a lot of the recordings Skylar made in his first year out of prison. It's more than 100 files. Skylar's mom, Debbie, is on the tape pretty often. She's an artist who used to paint illustrations for a stationery company and now teaches at the local high school. In one recording that Skylar sent, he and his mom are looking through a stack of Skylar's old stuff from when he was a kid. They find an assignment from when he went through the D.A.R.E. program in elementary school. Oh, this D.A.R.E. thing is... Hilarious. Hilarious. Debbie and her husband, Mark, have done a lot to support Skylar. They emptied their retirement account to pay for detox and rehab facilities. They hired a high-priced lawyer when Skylar faced prison time. And when Skylar was in prison, they visited and called often. After he got out, they welcomed him back home, even though they worried a little about what it would be like to have him there. Debbie picks up the D.A.R.E. assignment and reads from it. In my future, I plan to be a good athlete, have a good job as a Disney artist, have a family and stay healthy. If I take drugs, all of this could be taken away from me. Oh, that's a sad sentence. That's, this is a very sad thing to read, Skylar. And then you have a scene to freeze up against the wall, spread him. Oh my gosh. Ugh. Are you serious? Yeah. I've asked Skylar about this tape. He says he sounds excited because he thought this recording could be good for his podcast. And he also says that in the moment, he probably didn't want to think too much about himself as a kid, drawing a cartoon that would turn out to predict so much about his life. Officer, what's going to happen to me? That's very sad, Skyler. That's wild. You'll have to read that on it's your like thing. I'm, it's, like I, it's like a prophecy of some kind. It's very sad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too. At least I have you to help walk me through it. Always. You oh, sweet little boy. Yeah. You're a sweet mom. <laughs> you still are. And you still are sweet. 
When Schuyler was young, he was singled out for his talents. At nine, he won an art competition and met President Clinton. In junior high, he was elected student body president. In high school, he was a good athlete, sang in an a cappella group that performed for the governor, and went on summer mission trips with his family's church. But looking back, Schuyler thinks he always struggled. He had a hard time focusing, and he could be impulsive. He thinks that's why he started shoplifting when he was still in high school. He mostly took small things, he says. But he did it pretty often, and went years without getting caught. In some of his most memorable recordings, Schuyler is looking backward. He's examining his past and trying to reconcile it with where he is now, or trying to take some lesson from it. Occasionally in those moments, he'll learn something completely new. For example, the whole time he was in prison, he told one version of his last arrest before he got sent away. He was the victim, and the police were super aggressive. But after he got out, he read the police report. And then he went to West Seattle, where the arrest took place, and recounted the story to himself on tape. Basically, my arrest was really messy. Um, I was high on methamphetamine. I was high on heroin. I was high on Xanax. I was a mess. An absolute mess. And I I get pulled over by a cop. In 2012, when this happened, it was a bad moment for Skylar to get pulled over. There was already a warrant out for his arrest, so he gave the police officer a fake name. It didn't work. The officer, a woman, asked him to step out of the car. At that point, I tried starting my car again, which began a chaotic rumble and tumble and struggle. I fall out from the car on top of her, at which point she chipped a tooth. I don't know if I was like trying to strangle her. I cannot imagine how terrifying that would be. I know I'm not a violent person. I, I've never really, I've never been one to start anything. And I just remember feeling this desperation. It's like, if I could just tell you that I'm not resisting and you could let me stand up and I can explain I would have the opportunity to to keep running, (laughs) to run away, you know. So I was just, I was yelling out, I am not resisting, I'm not resisting, while I was completely resisting. If you search Skylar's name, the top results are about this assault. The police officer's tooth was knocked loose, and another officer who jumped in to help had torn muscles in his chest and shoulder. I don't like thinking that I'm a bad guy. I don't. It's so disturbing to think that it was me doing those things and not just a stranger because it feels like it was a stranger. Skylar told me that at the time he recorded this, seeing himself as the bad guy was a new thing for him. I do remember feeling almost excited in a terrified sort of way, I guess, that like I was getting to the bottom of things and how hopeful that was in a way. He says telling the story on tape helped him see himself more clearly. It was like he lifted a delusion he'd been living under. And that was painful, but it also felt like a good thing. I think it's because if I can understand why I'm here in this shitty existence, <laughs> like, or not, not that, that's too bleak, but like, why am I here and not where I thought I'd be at age 33? Like, why did I go to prison? Why did I ever start doing drugs? Why did I get divorced? Like, why? How did that actually happen? Because I, I still don't really get it. You know, especially when compared to, like, the rest of my family and, and, and friends. And, and, like, how did this happen? Why would I ever compromise 
things. Like, it, like how? Why is this my life? Yeah, yeah. Anytime I can answer in any way, like those questions, it it's like another brick that I can put into the like the new foundation for this new life that I'm trying to 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 live. Skylar told me that honesty is a big part of that new life he wants. When I asked him to explain what he meant by that, he told me how he used to pay for drugs before his heroin addiction got found out. He stole computers from college campuses. He would walk in, pretending to be a student, and slide a laptop into his bag. He specialized in MacBooks and resold them through Craigslist. The people he was closest to when his heroin addiction first got found out, his wife and his friends and his family, all thought he had a paid internship working in architecture. He would get up in the morning and dress like he was going to an office, but actually he'd go steal computers or go to his dealer or download a movie and watch it at a coffee shop. My parents would ask, so how's, how's work, you know? Yeah, it's good, but boy, is that a challenge, you know? Geez, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realize architecture was going to be so uh, mathematical, you know, or whatever. He made up coworkers he would talk about. Like, oh, okay, so uh, my new boss's name is Ryan. And he's, he's, he's the nice boss. And Jake, like, he's the assistant boss. And he's more of an asshole and rides me all the time. But he's not in all the time. There's a question that Skylar says haunts him. Am I still doing the same things I've always done? Recording helped him believe he wasn't slipping back into that groove of telling lies about what he was doing with his life. He was documenting things, committing them to tape, creating a record that wouldn't lie. Recording helped him in more straightforward ways, too. It kept him company. Most of his friends had moved on while he was in prison. They had families, moved up in their jobs, moved away. He wanted connection and wanted to make new friends. But when he tried, it backfired. For example, he told me this story about finding an Ultimate Frisbee pickup game one time, after he'd been out of prison for about six months. It used to be one of his favorite sports, and during the game, he hit it off with one of the other players. We were, um just joking around the whole time. And so, yeah, afterward, he invites me to go get a drink with them um, down the street. And I was like, heck yeah, like, this is nice. It's like, awesome. Skylar texted his mom to let her know that he was hanging out with some new people he'd met. He says the guys he was with seemed pretty successful, like they all had pretty good white-collar type jobs. So then it, they, they're like, so yeah, what do you do? And I'm like, working construction. Skylar felt embarrassed about it. So he said something like, it's not my life's work. They asked a few questions, and he wound up telling them about his addiction and serving time. Pretty soon, two of the guys, including one who had given Skylar his number, moved to a different place in the bar. Skylar didn't think much of it. He just kept talking to the guy who was still there. But the conversation was different. The connection was all of a sudden just gone. And then I kind of start being like, oh, wait, are they being, like, did that happen because of, like, me telling my past? And then after, like, I don't know, half an hour or so of that, the guy that whose number I had got, like he comes up to me, he's like, "Look, man, I I got I got a wife and kids, and um, you think you could delete that number from your phone?" <laughs> like, yeah, it sucked. Was that like the first time you'd really tried to make friends after yeah, prison? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I it affected me. It 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 like. I think, first of all, I was kind of embarrassed with how excited I was, you know, and. You mean like telling your mom about it? Yeah. <laughs> like that. Yeah, it's it's kind of embarrassing, <laughs> but uh, way worse to then go home and, and like. Yeah. I can't believe I'm actually I haven't thought about it, but I'm sorry I'm getting emotional. Um. Yeah. Did you tell your parents about it? I mean, did you did you I tell them what had happened? Not a, not 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 a, like not for a while. I actually. Um, why are you asking me that? <laughs> no, because uh, I didn't. Yeah, like I. Um. I think I just probably said it was great. Skylar wanted real connection. But in the absence of that, he had his recorder and those 50,000 listeners he imagined to help him feel less alone. Sometimes he would perform for the microphone, like he was entertaining a friend. There's one piece of tape that sticks out as an example, a time when Skylar was really hamming it up. He's alone in his car, driving. Oh, hi. Oh, what's that? Oh, I'm just in the middle of one of my, uh, you know, crazy moments. <laughs> 
just uh, going to another appointment and I'm hella late. I mean, I just don't even know if I can ever figure this shit out. Uh, oh, oh, the, the appointment that I'm going to? Oh, it's for a psychiatrist to maybe help me with being late. First time ever, mm, no, that's not the right turn. Ooh. First time ever seeing a psych mm, doctor. Um, I think this means I'm moving closer and closer into insanity. <laughs> At least that's how I take it. I mean, I don't know how you would take it. If you can't tell by my voice right now, I've lost it. The, uh, the caboose has left the station. The train has left the station. The, the, tra the train has, has been derailed. The caboose isn't even attached no mo. You know what I'm saying? So, uh... <clears throat> I'm um, parking, and then um, I'm gonna run inside. Maybe I'll even walk you to the door, because that's what a gentleman would do. He'd walk his guest to the door. Hey, and 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 like it or not, you're one of my guests, and I gotta treat you with respect and with dignity, more so than I'm treating, hopefully, my new psych doctor, because right now I'm treating him like a piece of shit. There were other times when Skylar was performing in a slightly different way. Like with his parents, Skylar says one of the most important things recording did was help him talk to them. In the past, they'd struggled to listen to each other, but with a recorder rolling, their dynamic shifted, tensions eased up, and they talked more openly. There's a conversation between Skylar and his dad, Mark, that's a good example of this. They're at a place called Gators, where they go together for dinner sometimes. Before you hear the tape, there are a few things to know about Mark. He's a Presbyterian pastor. And not long after Skylar got out of prison, he got a job at a charity that serves homeless people, working with men who are addicted. In other words, he spent a lot of time learning about addiction and trying to understand Skylar's problems. But he also gets frustrated sometimes. He worries about how much money he and Debbie have spent trying to help Skylar over the years. That's the jumping off point for this conversation. Mark's sense of responsibility for Skylar and the conflicting emotions that come with it. Skylar's playing the part of the interviewer, asking his dad about it. What does it feel like? It feels like it's a rock in a hard place. If I say, gee, I'm sorry, son, you got yourself into this situation, see you later. Not see you later, but you, you got to figure that out on your own. Right? Exactly. I agree with that. There's that option, but that's, that's not the way I'm wired. At the same time, the, 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 the flip side of that coin is it pisses me off. Yeah. I hear you. And I, th I think we just have to say those feelings are on the table, and we we still love and care for each other. But this is it is what it is. So how does how does that make you feel? I mean, before prison, I don't know if I ever really had much of a realistic view of life I used to just take from you and mom I abused the the assumed roles of you being the dad and mom being the mom and me being the, the son and I get myself into predicaments and you, know, you guys are supposed to take care of it I, I don't like that person. And, you know, I, I don't see that as your guys' role, really at all. Now, I rely on your guys' help, but that assumed quality I don't think is there anymore. What we're hearing there may not sound like the most emotional connection in the world, but Skylar and his dad are both actually saying what they think and feel. And Skylar says that wouldn't have happened if he weren't recording. For whatever reason, bringing the, the mic and setting it up at the table, it changed the dynamic in this way that made me look forward to sitting down with my dad or with my mom or with both. Um, it, you know, it's kind of, it was like a somewhat of a therapist in a way of like <laughs> holding us accountable, even though, you know, um, it was just a piece of machinery before, before you started recording, what would a conversation 
like this have been like? Well, I, I, yeah, I, my dad and my fighting is not, um, like, it stays pretty cordial most of the time. But the emotion that would be there, I can't speak for my dad, but I know for me, like, it would override my my thinking or like um i would just become this like scared little child that was making his dad upset or something a scared child that that then either acts out by totally shriveling away and wanting to die or responds by saying hurtful things and and being an asshole kind of so recording did a lot for skylar but it didn't fix everything and it didn't make skylar's challenges easy to overcome in his tape, there are signs of trouble that Skylar often doesn't explain or directly address. A conversation with his dad about needing legal representation. A recording of him calling the local court to try to deal with a warrant. Skylar had a few run-ins with the police during his first year out of prison. Not long after he got out, he got caught stealing a lamp and some other things from Target. A few months after that, he shoplifted two microphones that he thought would help him make his podcast. And then there's an incident from last September, just over a year ago. According to the police report, Skylar was alone in his car, not far from where his parents live. Someone in the neighborhood saw something that concerned them, and they called the police. When the officers arrived, they found Skylar with a pipe and a small amount of meth. I've talked to Skylar about the report. He told me he used meth a handful of times during his first year out. Maybe three, maybe seven, definitely no more than ten. He says he doesn't really understand that decision and feels a lot of shame about it. And he seems both surprised and unsurprised when I tell him that it's not something he talked about in his recordings, at least not directly. He explains he didn't think his mistakes had a place in the story he was trying to tell, because his idea of what his story should be comes from church. He's been going his whole life, and he's heard a lot of conversion stories, testimonies they're called. And those stories follow a simple and redemptive plot. When you share a testimony, you talk about how you were and who you were before you met Jesus, and then you talk about your conversion, and then you talk about your life afterward. And it's this very neat way of thinking about your life. And I think I really want to think about my life in the same kind of way as like prison being the conversion moment. And that since then, it's, yeah, it's been a, it's been a struggle like emotionally, but I haven't done the same things. And that's that just that's not true, um, mm -hmm. and so I don't know how to even go about like talking about that. I, like it, it's not something that I I even like thinking about. There's a mantra that's familiar to anyone who struggled with addiction: relapse is part of recovery. Skylar believes it's true. It certainly has been for him, but he still has a hard time accepting his mistakes. After he'd been recording for six or seven months, Skylar pulled together a pilot episode of his podcast. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs. This is a clip from it. Playing baseball in my backyard and going to church on Sundays. But at 28, everything was different. I was in jail, waiting to be sentenced to prison. The episode is short, about 10 minutes long, and it doesn't include any of the tapes Skylar recorded. His parts were all scripted or acted out, like in this part. For my entire life, prison was the antithesis to my world. And now I was stepping into a place I could never fully prepare for. I wanted to yell out, Hey, see you! I'm fixed! I'm ready to go home now! I've learned my lesson! I've written a lot of first drafts, and Skylar's has some classic problems. The tone's wrong. He's not using any of his great tape. Skylar was disappointed with it, too. It made him think, who am I kidding? Who's going to listen to this? I'm never going to get an audience. But at some point, he decided that maybe he was okay with that. Once I finally realized, like, this is way harder than I thought, um, it started becoming more just for me than for this make-believe audience, which I, I'm glad it did. I'm glad that I didn't give it up. I realized, oh, th this thing has been comforting to me. And just having this phone up to my mouth in my car when I'm scared, you know, has been empowering. And I don't really want it to stop. 
Skylar wrapped up probation early this year, in March. Not long after that, he decided he wanted to move to Bellingham, a couple of hours from his parents' house. He'd reconnected with an old friend who lives there, and visiting made him feel hopeful. Around sunset one night, when I was in Bellingham to see Skylar, he took me to a place called Boulevard Park. It's one of his favorite spots in the city. It's on a big bay, and you can see craggy mountains poking up on the far shore. A couple of his friends were going to be there, and he wanted me to meet them. When we got there, there were sailboats heading in for the night, and a lot of people standing around watching the sky change. A new friend of Skylar's showed up with her puppy, and then a guy named Andrew, who Skylar met not too long ago. Skylar was happy to see them both, and pretty hyper. He was taking sunset selfies, playing with the dog, striking up conversations with strangers. Andrew wanted to know what Skylar and I had been up to all day. Did he play you any of his music? No, we were talking about Dude, that. Dude, check should this he, out. Should, oh, you wait, play. should he play me some music? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, yeah Skylar's the best. So Stop no, he's got a voice of an angel. I can't it's believe me, you right? haven't yeah. heard him play. So a little while later, Andrew and Skylar and I all headed back to Skylar's place. Oh, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, Death of Me. Play that one. Play that one? Play that one first, yeah. Watch, this is going to be too high now. Okay. I, yeah. Working hard and I'm the pain She turned my heart and turned insane My life is so unordinary She dream of when the days are plain I can't believe The pain I cause my friends and family Lately, Skylar's been working on something, a simpler version of his podcast, interviews with friends and family and people he's met, mixed with music he's writing himself. He's got three episodes in the works, and he's almost finished with them. He's not sure how great they are. In fact, he thinks they're probably a little embarrassing. But he's trying to follow Alex's advice. If he wants to get better, he's going to have to work at it. Molly Messick is a senior producer of Startup. Coming up, a Canadian startup grows into a billion-dollar unicorn, then hits a wall. Their plan to battle back leaves the investors confused. Yeah, I tell them about this, and like, so we're going to build an economy around a new cryptocurrency, and we're not going to make any revenue. Is that what you're saying? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. How that crazy sounding plan brought in $100 million. That's next time on Startup. Startup is produced by Bruce Wallace, Luke Malone, Simone Polanin, Emmanuel Barry, and Amy Standen. Our senior producer is Molly Messick. We are edited by Annie Rose Strasser. Production assistance and fact checking by Max Gibson. Mark Phillips wrote and performed our theme song. Build Buildings wrote and performed our special ad music. For full music credits, visit our website. Andrew Dunn and Ian Scott mixed the episode. Special thanks to Debbie and Mark Gronholtz, Shane Gronholtz, Zach Siegel, and Pat Walters. When his episodes are ready, Skylar plans to start posting them at fellpodcast.com. That's F-E-L-L podcast.com. If you or someone you know is struggling with substance abuse, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has a number you can call, 1-800-662-HELP. That hotline gives referrals to local treatment facilities and support groups, and it is completely free and confidential. To subscribe to Startup, go to Apple Podcasts or whichever app you like to use, or check out the Gimlet Media website, gimletmedia.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Podcast Startup. Thanks for listening. Lisa Chow will be back next week. We'll see you then. If it's the 
the death of me Thanks to our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace helps you turn your dreams into reality with beautiful websites featuring powerful e-commerce functionality and built-in search engine optimization. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code STARTUP to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. 